Next up is Max Silts, uh, who you heard last time keynoting our talk. Max manages the legal team doing open source licensing and compliance at Alphabet, um, setting open source policy across the company and managing business relationships and corporate structures for some of Alphabet's most important open source projects. He's not going to be talking about Fitbit's acquisition. He's going to be talking about legal governance for open source foundations. Max. You can also start by telling us something which is not on that profile. Um, I just moved to a new condo in San Francisco. <laughs> I regret, I regret it immensely. Well, I have mixed feelings about it. Um, it's, yeah. Um, okay, hello. Um, let's talk about this. How to give up control. Does that feel scary to anyone when, when you see that title? Well, Google is talking about it, so. <laughs> so it must be, okay. So let me, let me just start by, it implies you thought you had control to begin with? All right, that's a great, that's a great response. Um, so a little bit about our group. Uh, we run sharing for intellectual property across the company. So we're a mixed group of lawyers and program managers who handle legal and policy making issues around sharing. So we have one group that does compliance, transactions, M&A, another group that does standards, and then a new group devoted just to open source foundation governance and sitting on external legal committees and basically working with Mike. It's a whole group just devoted to working with Mike. Um, and expressing a point of view, because this has become such a big issue that we need a corporate point of view on it. And uh, so here's my goal for the talk today. First of all, who, do we have any students? Any law students in the room? Okay, hello students. I want to get you excited that this is actually a practice area. And I want to use this talk to kind of give you a taste for what this practice area looks like, separate from like transactions or corporate law. And I want to get you excited about it. Also. Any lawyers in the room, if you're bored with your job, do this job, because it turns out that it's the most fun job that you can do, I think, in open source. So let's just enumerate some of the cool things that you get to do when you are running a foundation's practice. Corporate formation, tax and regulatory compliance, privacy, antitrust and competition, trademark uh, management, obviously open source licensing and compliance, and then this last thing, which is going to be the focus of my talk today, which is soft governance. So how to get people in the project to agree to do stuff together. And it's kind of legal and it's kind of not legal, but it turns out to be the most essential part of the practice area. So two reasons why we should focus on soft governance. First, it's the most fun. And it's really important to have fun at your job. But the second, if you're thinking about marketing yourself or you're thinking about we're trying to build this practice up as a distinct thing that you can do. It's the best value differentiator for a student or, an, or, or a, a new attorney. Because the other work is easily farmed out, right? It's not too interesting, it turns out, to just spin up corporations all day. Also not too interesting, slightly more interesting to try to get nonprofit status for a corporation. It's super interesting to work with project participants to get them to agree. And so, um, here are some of the basic outlines of what soft governance entails. Uh, but I'm going I'm to do something else. I want to tell you a personal anecdote of how this actually happened to me. Because I think it best conveys what, just giving a taste of what, uh, how, how I see the open source foundations practice area to be. So I want to tell you a story of a negotiation that happened around a garden. So we, uh, a colleague and I went to Europe, and there was negotiation taking place in a university hall, and around it was this beautiful garden. And so we were really excited, and I, I love gardens. So we decided to walk a couple of times and do some briefs before we got into the negotiations. So first, both of us are heavy on the law and economics movement, very theoretical. And so 
We walked around the garden. It was, your, it was like a French-style garden, so very organized. Um, and we started with some basic assumptions about what we thought our job was. As attorneys, uh, talking to people who wanted to do, participate in this foundation. So the first is, we had this idea of principal agent theory, and also Jensen and Meckling's theory of the firm. And our idea was, our client had the power, other people didn't have the power, they, can, they could take some power, and maybe we should give it to them, but in order to do so, we'd expend some kind of monitoring cost, right? Because it's great to try to get people to do stuff, but then they always want to go do something else from what you told them. So you have to pay. You have to pay to watch what they're doing. And the question is, okay, there must be some perfect mathematical point where we know exactly what to pay. So this negotiation basically doesn't even need to happen because it's already happened in the law and economics movement. There's already a perfect equilibrium reached. We just need to trade information with each other over and over again until it is discovered. At least this is what I felt like um, as, a, as a law student. You read all these papers and you really think that there's this perfect theoretical solution. And then here's what actually happened when we got into the room. So what actually happened was the client said, hello, I am dictator for life over this project. And the other party said, that makes us extremely uncomfortable. And our client said, yes, yes, I am the dictator for life over this project. Also, I'm in technical control, and that means, because open source is a meritocracy, that means I'm in legal and financial control. And the other people said, oh, okay, okay, how about a compromise? You can set high-level goals, but we're gonna, why don't we jointly control funding, and, and let's figure out some governance that it's gonna work out for the long term. And then our client, to our great surprise, because it's not what we had discussed, <laughs> just kept saying, no, no, I am the dictator. This is it. And so we went, we took a break. We went back to the garden and walked around and we, we really had to think a second because all the preparation we had done and all the theoretical groundwork we had laid for this practice just went up in flames immediately because there was no information trading. Our client just dug his heels in and that was it. So we, we, I think we had some lessons right in this intermediate point. The first lesson was theory is really hard to apply. So I'm still a big believer in, law, in the law and economics movement. I think it has a lot for practitioners to think about. But it's really hard to discover these equilibrium, equilibria when real people are involved. Also, your brain goes to spaghetti when you practice open source law long enough because you just think I could just apply a template license to every situation. Even codes of conduct you no longer need to think about, right? Because you could just apply a template code of conduct. There, what, there did not seem to be a governance template to just apply. Like, it turned out it did need some lawyering. It did need some thought. And try as we wanted to to force a pre-existing structure onto this thing, it just wouldn't happen. And then this thing was, this final note we talked about and it was very shocking to us. The participants knew each other already. That was weird. They were speaking another language to each other and I just kept thinking, why don't they just do what I tell them? Because I know what's best for them. Why won't they do this? I was just very shocked. So second walk around the garden, go back to the negotiation. Oh, sorry. And here is where I had an epiphany before we went back in the room. The first thing is that a practicing attorney in this new practice space that I want us to market and think about as like a distinct area, we cannot and should not erase the pre-existing relationship between the parties. We cannot and should not try to apply some template governance. Instead, if you're a good lawyer, what you do is you help them write those verbal norms down. In fact, that is the most important job you have. And as you're writing these verbal norms down, that's where you can nudge them gently towards correcting the problematic behaviors or structures that they already have in that existing relationship. But it really has to start from understanding the participants, respecting their pre-existing relationships. Even if you don't get it, you got to write it down to some extent. Okay, so we went back in and the client picked up this line again, I am dictator, I am dictator, that's it. And then we were able to communicate to him our newfound epiphany, but also some tough love. Would you like to be dictator by yourself? 
because if you keep behaving this way, everyone else is going to leave your project. And the client said, well, no, that would not be good. That's kind of counter to the goals I have. And so we decided the client could join the board and get an executive power to set the vision for the project, but then the board could veto bad decisions. So really the client did get to be the dictator for life, but the rest of the board felt that they had some oversight, and as they were contributing a lot of money, this made them feel comfortable. Now, I could have never just applied a template governance situation, and there is no one right governance for this situation. It really, the correct solution really came from the pre-existing relationship between the parties, right? All we did was listen to them and then nudge the most problematic behaviors away in the process from translating those verbal norms to written. Okay, so some final takeaways. We went back to the garden at the end of the day and we, we, we debriefed. So even though we started thinking that uh, foundation governance practice does not follow the theory of the firm that was uh, hypothesized by Jensen and Meckling. It turns out it is exactly like the theory of the firm and open source foundation governance is the same thing as corporate governance. And uh, if you're into corporate finance or corporate governance, a great book by John Tyrrell called Corporate Finance, I highly recommend you should read it because the same issues that corporations face when they're going to seek money, when they're giving up power, happens when people try to give up power in open source foundations. This is, this is what we realized at the end. Everyone loves control. It feels good. It turns out it's extremely scary to give that control up. Not only do people love control, but as long as someone has control over a project, they will consume all the perks that they can without regard for anyone else's well-being. They will consume money, social standing, technical leadership, just the same way that an owner of a company will do the same thing. They'll use the corporate jet, order food all the time, try to get their apartment paid for by the company. Things that I've personally seen, not at my current company, but at prior companies. Okay. The lesson is here, giving up control is painful. But just like a CEO sells equity and submits their previous greedy behavior to monitoring in exchange for capital, it is actually logical for your client to submit their behavior to increase monitoring because they're going to get increased resources that's going to expand the market for the project. And although they're going to have less control, everyone is going to make more money and have more wealth at the end of the day. Uh, so, so just in summary here, foundation governance is its own practice area. Not only is, its own, not only is it its own practice area, it's probably the most fun. And it's the most fun because we've become extremely rote in all our other practice areas. Even codes of conduct, which just like a year or two ago were really fun, aren't fun anymore because people have written most of the ones that you'll use. But this always takes an active brain. Not only does it take an active brain, but this is the exciting part too. It requires active listening and empathy. Who would think that your job doing open source compliance or open source related work would require empathy? So it, it requires empathy because people get really touchy about their projects and no one wants to let you in if you're an outsider, especially if you're a lawyer, unless they feel like they are heard. And I guess the final point here is there is no one solution to or one path to a healthy governance for a project. There are a million paths. And I had a lot of fixed expectations about what I needed the project to be. And those were wrong because it prevented me from listening to what the client needed and what the counterparty needed and thinking creatively and just figuring out where we could nudge their most problematic behaviors. So don't do that. Don't have fixed expectations and try to think creatively if you can. All right, thank you. Thank you, Max. Um, as you can see, we are going to swap jobs because mine seems more fun. <laughs> um, everybody who needs career advice in this new practice area, see Max later. Uh, 